Good evening, and welcome to the Democracy Series, hosted by the Center for Effective Government and the Chicago Center on Democracy at the University of Chicago and the Seminary Co-op book Bookstores. My name is Kevin Cromash, and I'm the Senior Research Associate at the Chicago Center on Democracy. And at, at the Center for Effective Government and the Chicago Center on Democracy, we bring together scholars and practitioners to host discussions and generate ideas about how to strengthen democratic institutions in service of a more effective government. And in this installment of our book series, we're speaking with author Moises Naim on his book, The Revenge of Power, How Autocrats Are Reinventing Politics for the 21st Century. You'll have the opportunity today to hear him speak about various aspects of his book, and we'll save at least 15 minutes for audience questions. So please use the Q&A function if you have a question. Uh, tonight's conversation is being recorded and will be shared on Twitter at UChicagoCEG and at democracy.uchicago.edu. And if you enjoy the conversation today, I encourage you to attend future Democracy Series events where we'll, we will speak with other authors to continue exploring the state of democracy. So we have today Moises Naim. He's a highly influential author, internationally syndicated columnist, and distinguished fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Naim is the former trade minister of Venezuela and director of the country's central bank and former executive director of the World Bank. He's the chief international columnist and global observer for the largest daily newspapers in Spain and Italy with columns carried by all leading newspapers in Latin America. Previously, he relaunched the prominent journal Foreign Policy and served 14 years as editor. Among other high praise, former US President Bill Clinton said of his previous work that it will change the way you read the news, the way you think about politics and the way you look at the world. Tonight's book, The Revenge of Power, provides an important and original look at threats and opportunities for democracy across the globe. And I'm also delighted to present our moderator, the director of the Chicago Center on Democracy, Professor Susan Stokes. In addition to her role as the center's director, Sue is the Margaret Blake Distinguished Service Professor in the University of Chicago's Political Science Department. So Sue and Moises, I'll turn it over to you for what I know will be an exciting conversation. Well, welcome everyone. And what, a, what an honor and what a pleasure to have, um, to have Moises Naim with us today. Uh, we're gonna, have Moises say a few things about his book. Um, I'm going to have a few questions. We'll have a little conversation after that. And, uh, and then as, as Kevin Kromash mentioned, we will open up. We're delighted to take um, questions that you can write in the, in the Q&A section on the Zoom. So, um, so Moise, talk to us about the revenge of power, which I, I'll just start by saying I enjoyed very much, among other things, like your other books, it's extremely entertainingly and engagingly written. So any of you out there who think this is gonna be a kind of heavy, um, dull read, you've got the wrong author. So Moises, go ahead. Thank you, Sue. It's a pleasure interacting with you today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, the Harris Center, Public Policy Center. I'm very happy to be chatting with you. Uh, about 10 years ago, I published a book called The End of Power that essentially argued that in the 21st century, power had become easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. It was more ephemeral. And that uh, was happening everywhere, from the Vatican to the Pentagon, to the halls of power in, in Wall Street, uh, to Hollywood, uh, to labor unions, culture clubs, sports clubs, uh, military, newspapers, media, everywhere, power had become more ephemeral, uh, especially in politics. The, that was 10 years ago, the, the, the public, the, the, the book, uh, nine to be precise, but the book was written one year prior to publication. So it was a 10 year old uh, kind of uh, journey, a journey that was very eventful. Um, you know, it was uh, uh, China's uh, GDP in that period from 2011 to, to, to 2021. Uh, China's GDP went from 6 trillion to 7 to 15. Uh, we saw the explosion of social media, both in terms of profitability as in reach and in political influence. We saw, we had and suffered uh, the financial crisis 2009, 2010, that had very long tails uh, in my judgment. And they're still, we're still seeing the consequences of that 
crash and especially the way in which it was uh, tackled and, and uh, quote unquote resolved. Um, inequality boomed, uh, at least in the United States and in other uh, wealthy countries, it reached uh, uh, levels in economic inequality, income, uh, wealth inequality, social mobility started suffering uh, in, in ways that it that had not seen before. Um, climate change accelerated. Uh, uh, in, in artificial intelligence also accelerated automation and uh, this, you know, the, the, the disruptions in the, uh, the way we work. And of course, the pandemic, of course, Donald Trump. And I can go on and on and on uh, about the world changing events of the last decade. That list, and we all have that list, but that list seldom includes a very important factor. And that is that in that decade, democracy suffered deeply. The number of countries that were, that, you know, they were going to, the NGOs and organizations and think tanks that specialize in measuring democracy. You know, you can quibble about um, some of the methodologies, but the convergence, the, the consensus is that the past decade was a terrible decade for democracy in terms of, uh, you know, how many people in the world lived in the autocracies uh, increased significantly. Uh, Larry Diamond, the professor at Stanford coined the term the, the, the democratic recession. He, he argued uh, that uh, the world was uh, undergoing a recession of democracy, of freedoms, of uh, the checks and balances that limit the concentration of power. And uh, so the, the book, the, the new book, uh, the, old, the, the, the book, then, the, the decade old book was the end of power. The new book is the revenge of power. And it's based on the notion that uh, the, the people and institution who held power uh, we're not going to just sit back and relax and wait uh, to be displaced or challenged or, or coerced by newcomers and by the same forces uh, of power dilution that I discussed in the first book. So they put up resistance and, um, and, and they deployed all kinds of tricks uh, and methods and strategies and tactics. Um, so if um, in the first book I discussed uh, the, the centrifugal forces, the centrifugal forces that disperse power, uh, in this new book I discuss the centripetal forces that concentrate power. And power is uh, that's, then tends to be uh, abused uh, and, uh, and democracy tends to, to suffer. I, in the book, I, I mentioned the, the three Ps. I, I say that a lot of these uh, new uh, autocrats um, use the three Ps to acquire power and retain it. Populism, polarization, and post-truth. In the book, I show how, even though these are very old concepts and we have seen them before, in the 21st century, they combine in very different ways that have acquired a, you know, heightened potency and are very effectively deployed by these uh, uh, autocrats that want to look uh, like Democrats and stealthily undermine governments uh, from within. So we saw uh, a whole slew of government, a, a whole cohort of uh, autocrats that eventually won elections democratically, but as soon as they got to power, started undermining it from within. Uh, by limiting checks and balances, weakening, neutralizing them, um, and all in, in very, very often in highly st stealthy ways, in ways that are not uh, easily detected by the naked eye or by the eye of non-experts. You know, presidential decrees in the middle of the night, uh, the buying of members of uh, the Supreme Court, the influence uh, over Congress, the purchasing by cronies to the government of mass media. So they can claim that they have an independent private sector, privately owned mass media, but in effect, uh, these were uh, employees of the government that immediately, as soon as they got their hand in the in the newspaper chains or the, the radio and TV networks, they put them at the service of the regime. Uh, all of that has been happening in very profound ways. Uh, it is changing the world in very important ways. It belongs to the list of the most important things that happened in the past decade. Uh, but uh, in a lot of countries, we, they were, we were sleepwalking towards autocracy. And it's time to to stop that and be aware that democracy everywhere uh, is on the threat and requires attention, urgent attentions and new ways of doing things.
let me stop here and we can expand uh, some of the ideas I mentioned. Yeah, no, that that that's a great start. Let me let me just ask a, co a couple of questions that I, I about issues, topics you touch on in the book that I found very striking. So on the three P's, um, you mentioned that there's the so you know uh, um, you mentioned that we ha we know these phenomena already that they're they're they've been with us for a long time. Um, you know, there's there have been populist leaders for for centuries. Um, polarization is something that is familiar. When I was growing up, you know, we, the people who were against the war in Vietnam hated the people who were in favor of it and so on. Um, and um, and post-truth, I mean, there have been, you know, um, there's been in the United States and in other countries as well, kind of problems with, um, with the general public understanding or being willing to grasp um, scientific truths or other kinds of truths. Um, so I wondered if you could go a little more deeply into one of those three, the, the populism, and explain to us maybe with some examples, um, what is it that makes a current populist uh, politician different from a more conventional, more traditional politician operating in a democratic system? That's a great question. And so the first is that it's more stealthy. Uh, it's less on your face. It, they, if they can get away with it, they want to look like uh, Democrats. There is, uh, uh, it's very interesting how at the same time that democracy is in decline, uh, the appetite of dictators to look like Democrats is uh, heightened. Uh, and we see that uh, all the time. Uh, populism has always existed. Uh, it is often confused with an ideology. But the reality is that uh, you know we have populists of the left, of the right, of the north, of the side, uh, of the south, everywhere. You know, populism is not an ideology. Populism is a bag of tricks, tools, uh, strategies, uh, and tactics designed to divide and conquer. Is it based on that old uh, idea? Uh, and is the divide the nation between the noble people that is being abused by a corrupt elite? And that often creates conditions for the emergence of a charismatic leader that then promises to take care, protect, and support uh, the noble people that has been exploited by this hypocritical elite. So that is the historical pattern, uh, the, the emergence of a leader that uh, promises, that uh, claims that everything that had happened before is horrible, negative, uh, needs to be forgotten or destroyed, and that um, a new reality, a new political life, a new economic arrangements will take care of uh, poverty and inequality and crime and uh, exclusion and, and unhappiness. But the problem now is that uh, uh, polarization has uh, boomed. As you said, it has always existed also, but now it is combined with all kinds of identities, uh, all kinds of identities that make, um, you know, there is like polarization is like cholesterol. You have good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. <laughs> good polarization is the one that is democracy, in which you have different interest groups, different groups representing uh, uh, different uh, uh, goals that have to interact and battle uh, over uh, the, the control of government and eventually is resolved by an election. That's good. That's, democ that's democracy at work. But there is a different kind of uh, polarization that is bad which is the one that uh, is so deep that doesn't even allow the uh, government to govern, that uh, there is a uh, gridlock, there is uh, the impossibility, you know, people, uh, rivals are not even given their right to exist and exert political power or have ambitions. And, and, and the, uh, the identity uh, dimension of this has, in, has increased um, thanks to, to, to post-truth. As you said correctly, so polarization and uh, post-truth have always existed. Uh, uh, Hitler had a ministry of propaganda. Uh, Mussolini did that too. Today, the Chinese government has a ministry of propaganda. The thing is that uh, post-truth is not just a government pushing for, for support and uh, manipulating the population. Post-truth creates a whole new uh, environment in which you don't need, first of all, it's not just governments, but it's both governments, free agents, or agents that seem to be free, but are at the service of governments. 
and uh, and the the reality is that uh, they are they have been ampli the the impact has been amplified by technologies and by so social media, and so you have uh, an empowered and energized and amplified set of uh, post truth realities that are influencing. Uh, the identity politics that heighten polarization that in turn create a, a very welcoming environment for populism. So you have to take the three and, and understand that they come as a package that reinforce each other and, and they have elements that have always been with us, but now in the, this century they have acquired a new hue and new potency. I'm sorry it was too long, but you know. It's oh, no. Thank you. No, uh, you know, another aspect of the book that I found really interesting was your description of support. This is connects with the notion of, of political identities and polarization. The, the notion that um, followers of, of political leaders, especially these sort of populist leaders, they, they sort of think of them more as the way that fans think of celebrities. So people who love, I don't know, Britney Spears or something, um, they think about them that way rather than as leaders of political parties that take positions on policies and that have to, have to run government in a competent way. And I think you, you're right to be very concerned. That's not, a, that's not the model of citizenship that we think goes well with you know, democratic accountability. But I was thinking as I was reading that part of the book that there's another kind of fan, at least in the United States. So I'm a, I'm a baseball fan and baseball fans are very critical of their, their teams. Um, so, you know, the second that our, uh, our Chicago White Sox start underperforming as they are at the moment, um, everybody becomes the new, you know, has has messages for the manager and wants the manager to do things differently. So it's a more kind of participatory and, you know, I love you, but I don't want you to work this way. I want you to do better kind of model. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, in your discussion of the, the sort of, it's almost like fans as in kind of the fans of a cult leader, what, what can be done to kind of shift that to a more, um, a more sort of maybe loyal but critical kind of stance, um, and and particularly with regard, you you talk about um, the problem of hardball politics and and you know and the and the ways in which fandom of the kind that you're describing can make people more accepting of of hardball by their party. Do you have thoughts about you know you talk in, you talk a good deal at the end of the book about sort of what can be done, but talk to us about what your thoughts are about how to shift the model of, um, of citizen support for their party so it's a, a more, more effective and more meaningful. The relationship between followers and leaders has always existed in complicated ways. And Weber uh, was originally one that identified, he identified uh, the follower that uh, has some special condition, the, the leader that has special conditions that make followers follow in ways uh, uh, that are very deeply connected to that person's identity. And in some cases, that identity is related to sports clubs. And, uh, you know, what you, the way you aptly described uh, what happens with uh, baseball fans, you know, it has echoes uh, with soccer fans in Europe. Uh, in Europe, soccer fans also insult and send messages and ugly messages, both to the play their players and especially the coaches. That they call them technical directors, and they just get hit with all kinds of insults when things don't go well. And then they become semi-gods and heroes when the, 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 the team wins. Um, and there's some the, the three the three P politicians have discovered that fandom yields uh, better results because uh, you can it, it it also increases fealty and fidelity and commitment. Remember when Donald Trump said that he could go down uh, on Manhattan in Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and nothing would happen? Well, that has resonance with the notion that they have a leader, that they allow the leader to do whatever he wants. And we have seen that. We have seen how the followers of uh, the Republican Party in many senses, but of Donald Trump, are willing to believe anything and are willing to follow him uh, to wherever he takes them. So that's, the, that's fandom, that's the use of the techniques uh, and, the, and the methods uh, that create um, uh, uh, the, the leaders that are very attractive and can get away with anything based on the fealty of their uh, uh, 
of the, of the followers. So your very good question is then what to do. Because what to do has a lot to do in turn with how often we see segments of the population acting against their own interests. Uh, and that is uh, in, in part explicable by post-truth and the messages of post-truth, but also uh, by the kind of, can of, of leader they have that can take them to places that are not convenient to them, but they don't care because that's the way that uh, has been the, chosen by their, the leader they follow. Um, just to follow up on the, the issue of hardball politics, which you have very interesting things to, to talk about in the book, um, there's, there's all kinds of you know, important debates within the Biden administration and in the Democratic Party and so forth about whether to engage in hardball in response to hardball or whether to um, stick with um, what we might think of as more norm respecting kind of policy. So for example, as you know, the, you know, what to do about the January, the, the January 6, um, the, not just the people who took part, but the people who seem to be planning it, how, how aggressive should the attorney general be in, um, in possibly going, go, uh, pursuing criminal prosecution against a former president. Those are very difficult questions. And, and as you, you know, you point out in the book, there's all kinds of hardball issues that are equivalent, if not identical in other parts of the world, um, in particular, where we have these sort of backsliding um, parties and leaders. What, what's your view on that? Do, do you meet fire with fire? Do you meet fire with a better, a better way? Um, what are your feelings about that? I think this is a crucial question and what to do. And it, it, you know, a lot uh, hangs on uh, how this uh, decision is made and in which direction. The first reaction is that it is, is country specific. The way you will deal with this in Italy is different than the way you deal with this in the United States or, or Spain or Thailand uh, uh, or Hungary, uh, surely Russia. So uh, it is country specific, it's circumstances specific, it's issue specific. Uh, in the United States, we, have, we are debating and some of these hardball and, and you know, deeply contested, ferociously, ferociously contested uh, are about issues that do not matter that much in other countries. And in other countries, they fight over things that do not have any resonance in the United States. And in general, at the high level of abstraction, you, you could say that there are two words that protect, should protect a nation from that. One is con the constitution and the second is democracy. When you see, um, you know, the, we talk a lot about guardrails and make sure that uh, they contain excesses and distortions and deviations of democratic behavior. Well, we need to be attentive to those. And those very often are very obscure, are very technical, are very lawyerly, are very hard to grasp, but they need to be placed at the center of the conversation and make sure and ensure that the guardrails are fortified and, and respected, especially the, you know, the, the basic constitutional rules. And, and, and the other is democracy. You know, a lot of the problems of democracy are uh, typically solved uh, or, or better dealt with with more, dem more democracy. I'm, I'm gonna um, uh, take advantage of the fact that, we, we, that you are uh, uh, a Venezuelan and have played a very important role in earlier periods in, in Venezuelan public, public affairs. And uh, I, I, I teach a class on democratic erosion here at the University of Chicago. And when we talk about Venezuela, it's um, kind of de democratic erosion is in the past tense. It's there's no, there isn't any, you know, there's not much democracy left to erode and it's a, it's a sad state of affairs. Tell us, talk to us a little bit about how the themes of the book connect to, the, to, to that country and um, and and the themes of sort of diagnosis of what went wrong, but also the themes of what could be done. So a lot uh, of my interest on, on three Ps and the way I came up with it, the idea of having these presidents or leaders that depend on the three Ps uh, is, was of course driven by my experience watching how my country lost its democracy. Slowly, as a process, invisibly, uh, sometimes uh, with in-your-face decisions by the president, 
And so uh, as I watch Donald Trump run for office, win office and become the president and do, do what he did, I kept telling, you know, saying myself, uh, you know, I have seen this movie before, except that it was in Spanish. Uh, and uh, so the, perhaps the most important point is that uh, erosions of democracy were typically not erosion, but just breaking up democracy. It was a coup. And so a general put on his dark glasses, sunglasses, and says, you know, I'm it. I run the country. I am head of the junta. And uh, my, my soldiers are in the streets, and the tanks are ready to shoot at you. Uh, and, and that's it. Well, that still happens. And we just saw it in Myanmar and in Burma recently. Uh, but the norm now is uh, there is a slow moving, uh, hard to detect uh, process of undermining, neutralizing uh, checks and balances and, and, and term limits and all that. Um, and so that's the way it happened in Venezuela. And Hugo Chavez started by lying. And, and again, we can talk about how the normalization of lying has, is now a very important part of uh, the toolkit of, of, of leaders around the world. Uh, the big lie is now uh, seems to be the norm in a lot of, in a lot of countries. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the process in which there was lying, there was distortion, there was undermining, uh, you know, laws, regulations, traditions, uh, and, and routines, uh, were clearly, um, uh, you know, an attack on democracy, except that it was a process. It was a sliding down, uh, uh, down the path of uh, uh, autocracy in, in ways that are, were very powerful and also very stealthy. Great. Well, we have a question from, from an audience member um, and uh, let me just read it to you. Um, what's your, this is from David Reyes. What's your view on what is happening in Central America? Do you consider El Salvador's president an autocrat? There is this, uh, this continuum where you have North Korea in one side and Switzerland in the other. Switzerland is the most democratic or whatever the Scandinavian countries, you know, hyper democracy, highly consolidated, well functioning, well, norms are respected. And then you have the totalitarian type of leader that we see in, uh, in, in North Korea. And so the question is, uh, where do you put President Bukele? Well, he was elected democratically uh, and um, is trying to govern like that, but he clearly has been using uh, uh, methods that are not democratic. We have seen him doing things that are clearly uh, autocratic in nature. Um, and I think we will have, we will be surprised both in good ways and in bad ways um, by, by the way he's handling the situations. The good ways is that sometimes he shows an interest in, uh, you know, he, of, of being respected by the international community and not to be seen as another banana republic dictator. Uh, and uh, in other moments, he does things that are just uh, horribly anti-democratic. So, he is somewhere in the middle of that continuum between uh, North Korea and Switzerland or Sweden or Norway. So to follow up on the idea of the, the, the views of the international community and, um, and sort of the, the international dynamics of, of, uh, of these aspiring autocrats, um, I wanna ask you, this is unfair because this has happened after you've written the book, but I, I'm sure you have some views on the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and what that means for um, what we might have called an international cabal of, of aspiring autocrats. Um, do you think that there are fissures that have opened up in that kind of, um, that kind of alliance or cabal? Um, or do, do you see any, are there any silver linings that come out of this sort of, you know, very, uh, very almost caricatured ask, act of, of international aggression coming from um, a leading figure who's much admired by autocrats operating in democracies around the world. Yes, well, and Putin is surely one of uh, an, ex an extreme example of the three Ps. And you know, extremes are always good to illustrate uh, um, what one's, one wants to, to describe. 
Um, the, there is, let me start with the, the, the tragedy. The tragedy is we have a 19th, 19th century kind of uh, behavior in the 21st century that caught everybody by surprise. And Putin seems to not to mind uh, just destroying a country and killing innocents and, and seeing the atrocities and, that we have seen. Uh, you know, we everybody had thought that that was a 19th century kind of behavior that was, uh, you know, no longer with us. Uh, and the notion was that the more you intertwine an economy with trade and investment uh, and business and economic links, the more you were protecting uh, that country and neighbors and others from uh, being the victims of uh, uh, a, a war uh, like we are seeing now. Well, if it, that proof proof not to be the case, and, um, and we're seeing the consequences. The silver lining is that Europe uh, discovered that they were a superpower but had not realized it. Uh, Europe, by finding unity, by not just doing uh, the, the, the typical procedures that are common uh, in Brussels in the European Union, but they, you know, just in a very bold, very uh, effective way, the governments just got together and uh, moved uh, as a, uh, with unity in this and, and discovered that they were important players. And Europe is now an important geopolitical player. We don't know how sustainable it is and how long it will, uh, you know, the, the coalition will be sustained, but surely um, they now know what they need to do in order to be important, significant players that can shape us the global realities. It's probably a, an initial thing that happened has been the opening of Poland to enormous numbers of, of refugees from Ukraine and, and really moving kind of, um, you know, the government obviously um, welcoming refugees, but just common people from Poland being so warm and generous in their in their reception. Now behind that is a is is a reality of fear, I think. Um, so that was very heartening. And then and then somehow um, the um, the um, the reaction of of Viktor Orban in Hungary, which happened fairly quickly, was less encouraging. Um, do you do you think that uh, do you think that there's going to be kind of a new um, a new set of alliances? Do you think that that Russia will be will be more and more um, isolated? Do you think that there is any room for is there is there any kind of uh, um, you know breathing room between uh, between Russia and uh, and China at this point? Yeah, as you, as you notice, I did not uh, re respond to your point about the cabal because uh, the cabal seems uh, feels to me far more structural, uh, determined, and, and permanent. And uh, and here, what we seeing is highly volatile. is very new. is uh, many of uh, of what we a lot of what we see is unprecedented. And I think it's just uh, you know, uh, Chu and Lai, the famous. Uh, Chinese premier in the 70s was asked uh, what did he think were the consequences of a French revolution and he thought for a, for a little bit and then said well it's too soon to tell uh, and I think it's too soon to, to tell I think uh, there, there will be alliances the most important one is what role will China play here will China be an ally of Russia uh, an anti-American you know coalition or will it be a peacemaker and will be a country that can then decide that it will use its might and its weight and its influence internationally to try to make peace, to force peace uh, in, 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 the, in the region, um, or is just a spectator? Uh, so it's uh, th three scenarios, ally to Putin, uh, peacemaker or spectator. And, and that is still ongoing. I don't think the, the, even the, the Chinese have a, a, a definitive uh, answer to that question. But those are three clear scenarios for, for that. Of all the, the possible alliances, uh, that one, uh, the, the, the way in which uh, China will uh, develop its relationship with uh, Putin's Russia is going to be one of the most important. I suppose the answer to the question also will depend to some degree on the outcome of the war, which is very much still in question. Exactly. We have a question from Steve Stein 
Um, can you talk more about the social, political, and economic context that led to the intensification of the three Ps? Yeah, there is a bunch of them. Um, as I said, I, I, there, there, there is a, a very important tale, uh, consequences uh, of, of the financial crisis uh, of, of 2009, 2010, and the way it was resolved. I think technology has played a role uh, and is, will continue to play a role. Artificial intelligence is going to hit uh, uh, everyone uh, of us in ways that we cannot even imagine yet. Some of them very positive, some of them uh, quite uh, uh, complicated and, and difficult to stomach. Uh, uh, and so technology uh, is, is very important in this, but so is climate change. Uh, a lot of the, the frictions we have seen in the world uh, these days uh, are, are still uh, connected, are connected with, with, with climate change. Um, with the sociology, the, the social political conditions are um, what's coming, uh, Sue, and what I think I, 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 I worry about it is not what are the past forces that have driven the three Ps, but the new ones. And the new ones is a high, very potent and explosive combination of inflation and disdain for democracy. Uh, inflation is at a 40 year high. That means that there are at least two generations that did not live with inflation, that don't know what inflation is, that have not had the experience of seeing their salaries dis disappear uh, quickly and vaporize. Uh, inflation is a very, is a terrible thing. It's very hard to when it get once it gets entrenched, it gets entrenched. It's very hard to eradicate. And so this is this importance, this heightened importance of uh, inflation uh, and its political consequences uh, is going to coincide with uh, again uh, two cohorts at least of or, or more of people that have not lived in autocracies. And therefore, you know, they can talk uh, with disdain of democracy because they don't know what's the alternative. They have not lived in the alternative to the regime that they saw disdain, that they feel it's not delivering, that they feel is uh, 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 malfunctioning and all that. And they are right. The, the democracy in the 21st century needs to be repaired and fixed and updated. That's for, true, for sure but not tossed out in favor of uh, autocracies. Um, so democracy needs to be repaired and not thrown out and uh, replaced by a tricky dictator. Question from Amy Carr in the audience. Could you respond more to the second half of Sue's question, how to respond or move out of authoritarianism back to democracy, for example, in Hong Kong or Venezuela? You're getting very simple questions here. <laughs> yeah, one-liners with a lot of work <laughs> is the answer. No, those are very fair questions. Those are the questions that are uh, elicited by a lot of what they described in the book. Um, there is not a one-liner, there's not one solution, but there are, you know, in order to win this war, we need to win several battles. Um, one of the battles is to end the peaceful coexistence with lies. I already mentioned it, but uh, unless we, uh, we, we get uh, around uh, not, uh, we, there, there should be higher costs and consequences for leaders that lie. Boris Johnson and, uh, and, and Brexit, uh, uh, Donald Trump and his election, uh, to, um, Putin and his uh, insisting that he was just doing military maneuvers that he did not plan to invade uh, Ukraine. You know, those lies, very big lies. Um, um, and they, you know, they lie and nothing happens. I think it's very important that the things begin to happen. I am optimistic that uh, we will all have, that there is a convergence brewing of conditions that will make, um, uh, you know, post-truth uh, uh, different. Uh, I think we will have technologies that will allow all of us to know more about what is it that we are reading and who's sending it and with what interest and what uh, ulterior motives. And, um, and uh, you know, that we, we, it will enable us to think twice before retweeting or resending or liking uh, a message. 
And so technology is, on, there, I, I, I know there is a pipeline of projects and, and, app, and apps and innovations that are going to disrupt uh, the, the line in very interesting ways, especially because they're gonna be combined with uh, new rules and regulations like the, like the ones approved by European Union last week, which is a very important uh, kinds of regulations. Um, and I think um, the protection of the digital consumer Consumer protection agencies are normal around the world. Everyone has it, you know, markets fail and they don't, uh, are not that good at, for example, ensuring that the food we eat is perfectly healthy. Uh, and so there are, you know, it is accepted that markets can fail and that, that consumers can be protected in very specific ways. And that's true for everything except for digital consumers. All of us are intensive users and consumers of technological, uh, of digital products, but we are not protected by anybody. Uh, and so I think that will change. And so the combination of these three things um, and, and changing habits uh, of how, you know, the digital hygiene will become very important part. I think it's going to help us uh, deal with the truth um, or the, or the post-truth uh, uh, confusions that we have. And then after that, uh, if we get that right, there are all the, all the things that are in the book. The, the whole final chapter is, spells out uh, uh, five battles that need to be won in order to, be, to win the big war, which is protecting democracy. I, and I recommend to, to the audience, the, one of the things that's really Terrific about the book is the um, is that it does come around to it's it's a it's a wonderful diagnosis of many of the things that we've been we've been observing and we've been living through, but it also has um, some very fresh and interesting things to say about um, what's to be done, what 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 can we do, what can governments do, what can civic organizations do, and what can individuals do to kind of um, push back against some of these trends. Um, I'm very tempted to, to ask you a totally unfair hot, hot, hot take on, on Elon Musk buying Twitter with regard to, to our digital universe, but I'm going to, I'm going to hold back on that because we have another question. Um, before you, you take the question, I just want to say that I spent about an hour today <laughs> with some, with a group of friends, uh, on, on zoom discussing who was more dangerous, uh, a bigger threat to democracy, Elon Musk or Vladimir Putin. <laughs> and that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know how I would vote, but yeah, no, it's yeah. it's interesting that that uh, that question comes up. Um, so Yang Jiang in the in the um, chat has asked: There's a difference between pop um, between populist populist as a movement against the establishment vis a vis and uh, vis a vis populists in power. So the difference between populists who are who are heading movements and populists who, who are actually in power, with the former often trying to repoliticize social cleavages and represent a segment of the people not recognized, represented and integrated by the mainstream parties. Um, how should we make this distinction, therefore, um, treat differently between populist energy that calls for social integration, that strengthens democracy, and populists in power that may wreak havoc on governance? So I don't know the answer to that question. That's a tough question. Um, and, and essentially, I will take the part that says, you know, we have two kinds of populist, those that are already caught power and are in charge and are undermining democracy from inside. Uh, and, the, and the populists that are outside making all kinds of promises that they, they will not, you know, they will not be able to deliver, but still are very attractive to voters. And we, we have seen the elections in France, for example, are very revealing of these kinds of things. And what perhaps the most important thing to know is that for a, pop, a populist that doesn't need a majority. A, a populist needs, a, 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 I mean, a, they don't need to win by the by landslide. They, they just need a, 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 a small majority and, and divided and a divided electorate. So, uh, promoting different candidates, promoting different movements, promoting uh, the fragmentation of the electorate is the strategy that they're using. 
uh, and and uh, both those that are inside uh, the government that they have power, those that want power, that what they need, what they do, what we have been watching them uh, doing is fragmenting uh, the electoral space, uh, and therefore th they just need to get a, a, a majority in within a highly fragmented. Um, identity-based kind of uh, civic uh, electoral space. I want to ask you a question that's connected to what we were talking about before, sort of um, the big lie and, and, and how to push back against it and focusing, take, bring the focus back to the U.S. for a minute. Um, you know, many people, and, and you included, are very concerned in, about the future of American democracy and the future um, in the fairly proximate future, um, the 2024 uh, presidential elections, the, the fear is that, um, you know, whatever happens, whoever wins, one, one side or the other is going to be not just, um, not just frustrated, but actually not believe that the, that the outcome was, was, the, was the result of fair processes. And there may be, you know, maybe those beliefs are more grounded in truth on one side than the other, but nevertheless, those beliefs are going to be um, somewhat inimical, presumably to you know to, to democracy, where we rely on on kind of uh, a, a, a peaceful transition of power when when that takes place. So um, I wanted just to ask you about um, you know what can we? There are a number of really great suggestions, if, particularly in the last part of the book. Um, what would you recommend to people? You know, here we are. We're in the Midwest. Um, many of us are, you know, teach students who don't feel particularly that they can influence public policy, at, the, at least not at this point of their lives. What do you say to just, so I'm asking you a question that I frequently am asked um, by, by young people in particular, um, you know, common people, no particular sway, no particular connection to um, power networks and so forth. What can we do? The truth is that uh, we have a vision, most of us have a vision of democracy as a one event every five years, every four years, depending on the country. So the elections are, the, for many people, are the, the only relationship they have with democracy. They vote once. And so the, it's imperative that uh, uh, people start un understanding that democracy requires more than a few hours um, on a line to vote. Uh, it, it, there is a lot of uh, activities that are related to, to, to democracy that need uh, the attention of people like your students. Uh, and, 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 the, and, the, and the opportunities are there. Uh, it may not look easy and the, the barriers to entry may seem very high, but the fact of, is, of the matter is that the space exists. One area where it is indispensable to strengthen democracy is in the whole logistics of elections. We have seen how the Trump campaign and the Trump related entities are taking over the Republican parties, are spending a lot of money and ensuring that the, the officers in charge of uh, the vote counting and the integrity of uh, the of voter situation. Um, are partial to Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Uh, we have seen the importance of uh, the logistics of uh, elections in the last, uh, in the last uh, election. And there is their space in order to, be, uh, to activate uh, for whatever party, but to make sure that uh, uh, elections are, are fair, uh, not uh, the, the, just the day of the election, but before the day of the election, there are all kinds of uh, rules, regulations, tricks, technologies uh, may be used to subvert uh, and, the, and, and, and trick the, and create more of a sham election. A question that I'm asking you, mindful of your training as an economist, uh, populist sort of, when you think about the populace in the last century in, in say in Latin America, perhaps other parts of the world, the United States for that matter, a, a kind of a, a, a thread through their thought was um, railing against economic elites and favoring, uh, arguing in favor of redistribution or um, sort of eco economic, improving the economic well-being of the, the common people, the descamisados or what, what have you. Um, land reform in Mexico, if we think about um, Lázaro Cárdenas as having been an early populist. Um, 
some would claim that popular uh, the, the background backdrop of populism today is also enormous inequality in um, in the advanced democracies. Actually, um, the region that you and I are, are very familiar with, Latin America, inequality is 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 very high, but actually has improved to some extent. Um, I wonder whether you could talk to us about. How do you, whether you think that uh, that growing sort of long term shifts beyond the Great Recession, but long term shifts in increasing economic inequality in many advanced democracies um, is a is a cause of the rise of of, of the phenomenon of, of the the three P leaders, and uh, and also whether you think what you think should be done, how how urgent do you think it is to address through use public policy to address problems of economic inequality. So already in 2011, I wrote a piece for the Atlantic uh, alerting that inequality was coming and it was coming big time in countries that did not have it for a long period. And um, I was thinking of uh, the United States where inequality was beginning to have the numbers that we only saw in Latin America, as you, as you mentioned. What was, so the first point is that inequality became a global conversation when the United States and Europe uh, had uh, unacceptable levels of inequality. Uh, you know, going historically, since the, the statistics on inequality started, Brazil was always the world champion in inequality. There is nothing new for Brazilians or for Chileans or for Mexicans or for Venezuelans about income inequality, wealth inequality. You know, we, we have lived with that for many, many years. Uh, and they were part of the conversation, but then now uh, the United States has that conversation and the United States is very effective always at exporting its anxieties. Uh, so the national conversation in the United States became the national conversations elsewhere. And that's a very welcome development. We, you know, we retrieved and uh, placed uh, uh, in, inequality at the center uh, of the conversation, that's a good thing. We have a long history in Latin America of uh, uh, governments that uh, run uh, on the promise of uh, lowering inequality. And uh, the, the, the evidence shows that uh, very often they end up with more inequality, that the tools and uh, strategies and public policies and economic policies that are used very often end up uh, exacerbating inequality for a long list of reasons, some of them country specific, others just uh, in, with, as a result of international conditions and so on. Um, but um, inequality is, uh, as you said uh, in the question, is, uh, is at the center of those, uh, uh, of, of the uneasiness of the, the, the discomfort that most people now have the, with the situation, their lot in life. And especially those that uh, are seeing how the, the, their daily lives are being appended by, by all sorts of things and inequality, and they see the inequality in, in a daily basis. So I think it's going to be with us for a while, but the good news is that uh, there is more, we, we, we know more about that, and uh, we know more about the importance of uh, uh, dealing with it and lowering it and uh, uh, avoiding it uh, um, to be the force that they eventually uh, uh, appends to democracy around the world. We have a question from, uh, from Mariana Prado. Um, I was wondering what your prediction of what will happen if we succeed in stopping the centripetal populist forces. Are we then back at the scenario you mapped in your previous book, The End of Power, i.e., are we back in the scenario of centrifugal forces, or is there another scenario that may ensue? Um, what will this scenario be? At this point, my ambition is, my hope is that the trend, uh, the downward trend of democracies is stopped, contained, and probably reversed. I want more countries to be moving uh, to the category of being called the liberal democracies. Um, that number has been terrible uh, in recent years in which fewer and fewer countries are moving towards more democracy and more and more countries are moving towards less democracy. I, want, I, I think it's imperative that we change that trend. Um, and there is a contagion effect. And again, I go back to your point about the cabal of uh, strong leaders 
that are the three P presidents that join each other in, in subverting democracies in the country and supporting um, the same movements in other countries that is happening. We need to stop that too. Uh, but um, again, I don't have grand ambitions for a wholly democratic world. I just want uh, it to, uh, I want the situation to stop the backsliding towards autocracy. And, and more, even more than that, and as a re requirement for that is this sleepwalking towards democracy, uh, towards autocracy. A lot of countries, a lot of leaders, a lot of voters are sleepwalking towards autocracy. And we need to stop that. We need to show what's going on and be more alert and uh, demanding that they need, they pay attention. I think there are a number of Russian citizens who many of them have left the, their country since the invasion who who very much regret not having been more active at an earlier point. Uh, Moises Naim, what a pleasure to to uh, to read your book. What a pleasure to hear from you. I'm going to turn things back over to Kevin Kromash, who's going to say some final words. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for this. This is a fascinating conversation. Um, and thank you everyone who's here on Zoom and those who are watching the YouTube live stream uh, for joining us in this installment of the Democracy Series. Uh, as a reminder, this is a joint initiative uh, between the Center for Effective Government, Chicago Center on Democracy and the Seminary Co-op Bookstores that brings you discussions with authors on critical topics of democracy. And you can find us all online. You can find CEG on Twitter at UChicagoCEG, Seminary Co-op at, semin at, at Seminary Co-op, and the Chicago Center on Democracy on our website, democracy.uchicago.edu. So thank you.